Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to TBR's webinar, Digital Disruption, Digital Marketing Services, and Ad Tech with Seth Lewinsky and Patrick Heffernan. I'm Allison Crawford, and I'm hosting today's webinar. Given the proliferation of digital content and increased use of digital devices, the digital marketing services and ad tech markets are growing at over 20% year to year. This is forcing companies to transform their businesses to encompass this dramatic shift in technology and change the market dynamic to make use of incoming services. TBR covers a firm who provide IT consulting and systems integration services, as well as the software solutions with analyze and optimize digital marketing programs. Before I pass this over to Seth and Patrick, there are a few housekeeping items I'd like to cover. First, we're recording today's session and we'll be posting it on our YouTube site, TBRI channel. We encourage you to visit our channel to watch this presentation or any of the others that we've posted. Second, we'd like to hear your opinions and thoughts on the materials we're presenting. <clears throat> Please send any questions or comments to the Q&A or chat function. The analysts will address them at the end of the presentation. Or you can reach out directly to any one of us at the end of the webinar to set up a private conversation. Third, we'll send up a slide to everyone registered for today's webcast within 24 hours of the conclusion of the webinar. You can also find these slides as well as other thought leadership pieces, webinar decks, and commentaries on SlideShare at www.slideshare.net backslash TBR underscore market underscore insight. And we'll share all these social media links with you again at the end of the presentation. Now let me introduce Seth Lewinsky and Patrick Heffernan. Seth is a senior analyst in TBR software practice leading our coverage of digital marketing platforms. Seth provides analysis of vendors including public companies such as Critero, Rocket Fuel, Tube Mogul, Amazon, LinkedIn, and Google. In addition to public company analysis, he delivers insights into private firms, industry trends, landscape analysis, and consulting and advisory services. Prior to joining TBR, Seth founded AdTech Advisory, a boutique consulting providing go-to-market strategy and business development services for companies participating in the digital advertising ecosystem. Seth has over a decade of experience in the technology and digital marketing sectors, working in startup and Fortune 500 settings. He has held sales and business development roles in the companies such as Yahoo and DataZoo. Seth is joined by principal analyst Patrick Heffernan, who manages TBR's professional services practice. Patrick directs the practice's syndicated portfolio and cultivates and manages projects on topics ranging from management consulting to firms' financial advisory services to emerging technologies. Patrick's responsibilities tap his expertise in competitive intelligence, strategy, and global political economic impacts on business cycles and consulting vendors. Prior to joining TBR, Patrick was part of a big four, service, a big four firm's competitive intelligence team conducting field work and analysis. His professional career started in diplomacy with Middle East postings as a Foreign Service Officer with the State Department and counterterrorism assignments with the National Security Council and the U.S. Department of the Treasury. And with that, let me hand this over to Patrick or Seth. Thank you very much, Allison, <laughs> and just hearing you say that all about me, I, I forget sometimes that I have a counterterrorism background, so I'll have to find a way to sneak that into a presentation on digital. But yes, that's Seth and I, and, and welcome everybody, thanks. We're starting this uh, presentation off with perhaps the most boring slide in the deck uh, and the biggest set of numbers we could find. This is our projection of what's gonna happen in digital marketing services and ad tech in 2015. And what we're gonna do over the course of the next uh, 25, maybe 30 minutes or so, is explain how it is that we come up with these numbers, why we think that this is uh, such a big opportunity, all the different moving pieces that go into looking at a $30 billion uh, ad tech space in 2015 and a $150 billion digital marketing services uh, space. Again, we wanna start with a big fat number and then walk through all the things that are going to, uh, that are gonna support that. And I encourage, as Allison mentioned, questions. Um, we're happy to take them at the end. Our idea here, here is to give you about 25 or 30 minutes of Seth and I uh, talking and then um, open it up to questions so that we can, we can really address the things that are on the top of your mind. And with that, I'll hand it over to Seth to sort of set up what we're talking about today. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks for the intro, Allison. Appreciate everyone's time here today. Um, so digital, as everyone knows, is a, a big world, um, creating a lot of opportunities, um, some confusion, uh, and certainly, um, inviting new entrants. So from a, uh, a digital uh, opportunity standpoint, when you look at the assets that are being created, um, whether that's a site, an application, uh, 
you know, there's definitely different stakeholders that can essentially have their their fingerprint on um, any sort of a digital asset from a strategy standpoint to building uh, even the, the back end uh, analytics. Uh, so if you're looking at the quadrants here, moving over to e-commerce, of course, you know, digital has really disrupted a lot of um, kind of brick and mortar businesses. So you look at folks like Amazon and, you know, they're kind of head and shoulders above many of the rest as far as e-commerce and being able to, um, you know, essentially capture wallet share that used to be spent, you know, in a store, in a mall, et cetera, uh, through an online um, portal. Uh, in addition, you know, digital, again, what does it mean? Well, depending on who you talk to, uh, a number of things. So we'll, uh, we'll dive into exactly what TBR covers here and the, uh, the taxonomy and so forth. But, you know, essentially in a nutshell, a uh, huge opportunity, a lot of, um, you know, participants, and that creates some uncertainty, doubt, and uh, that's, that's where there's, you know, additional opportunity, if, especially if you're a management consulting player or uh, an IT services firm. Yeah, this is this slide is um, make, makes me think of a presentation we did last week where we had strategy consulting right sitting right there in the center and some very similar uh, factors going all around. So the question you're asking now is, all right, digital encompasses so much. Why are you guys talking about digital marketing in particular and ad tech in particular as well? So for TBR, th this is our understanding of the entire digital transformation landscape and. Realistically, we can't bite off everything. We already look at cloud. We look at business intelligence and analytics. Uh, we have a, a team that's focused on telecoms as well. We have a devices group. Um, so we look at a lot of the things in the purple, but when we started to get to that outer rim, we had to pick what things we, uh, we could focus on most, and we decided to take marketing in part because marketing really does capture a lot of all those other aspects of the digital experience and, and the digital transformation. Um, and for many companies, it is probably the leading edge because it's the, it's the transformation that might be the easiest one for them to go through right away. So we're focused now on marketing, and I expect, and we can talk about this if folks have questions about the, the depth and the breadth of the TBR's entire portfolio, we can talk about it at the end, but I think we are going to expand from where we are with marketing to some of these other aspects of, of digital. And as far as trends, you know, what we're seeing today versus um, we'll call them new trends and then long-term opportunities. We just highlighted a couple of things. So, of course, ad tech and, and digital as a whole, you know, a lot of emerging disruptive technologies. And, you know, if you're looking at something like media buying, so people love to, uh, to make the reference to mad men versus math men. Um, it, it speaks volumes, and I, I think it holds uh, true. You have a lot of kind of old school business legacy models and media where, um, you know, there were the two martini lunches and a handshake, et cetera, uh, to really drive multi-million dollar businesses uh, or business um, transactions. And then today, a lot more of it's being led via software as a service or ad tech vendors who, you know, as a, through managed services are executing multi-million dollar uh, ad campaigns on behalf of major brands or working in tandem with their agencies. So um, new trends, you know, as a service has been around for a while, but it's definitely increasing as far as, um, you know, the, the types of, of companies who are embracing it. It's not just the agencies, it's also the brands directly, and it's not always um, enterprise level uh, players. It's also mid-market. So, um, you know, mid-market companies, I think is a, a huge opportunity and, and segment where, you know, even ad tech companies may have kind of uh, missed an opportunity that's, that's been there the whole time while, you know, I think predominantly a lot of these guys are, are focusing on, uh, you know, elephant hunting, so to speak, and going after Fortune 100 brands. Um, you know, if they had kind of set up their, their business models accordingly, they could have captured a lot of uh, SMB opportunities. So if you just look at a company like Critio or AdRoll, for example, uh, those are two companies very – very uh, keenly focused on SMB and doing very well. So um, last but not least, the, the whole notion of, you know, ad tech essentially plugging into an enterprise uh, marketing cloud where um, it's not just paid media, it's also uh, CMS, it's content management solutions and other things that are, you know, certainly part of marketing, but today ad tech has kind of been um, this niche 
nuance uh, component that's not quite, uh, I guess, integrated into the, uh, the marketing stack, so to speak, but I think that's changing really quickly. Um, so those are just three things that, um, that we wanted to highlight here. And we had, a, we had a, an effort over the last couple of months to pull together trends across all of IT, including IT services, and the last two, two sets of these trends here in digital marketing services and ad tech mirror or echo uh, what's happening in IT services more broadly. In particular, I would just call out the, the mid-sized businesses accelerating uh, software as a service um, or basically everything as a service, uh, as a business model, and the impact that that has on a lot of the larger players in the IT services space, IBM, Accenture, uh, even Deloitte, CSC, these are companies that have, over the years, made uh, fits and starts in terms of their efforts in attracting and, and retaining clients in small and medium enterprise, but with the adoption of as a service, um, as, a, as, a, as a going forward, as a, much as I hate that term, business model, um, those companies are forced to, to sort of play downstream, if you would. Um, the, other, the other part of it here is, is the impact of cloud. And uh, here, with the, we see it here mentioned within um, digital marketing services, um, and it's, it's playing across all of IT services, and it, and it cannot be, you can't possibly um, over-exaggerate uh, the impact that cloud is going to have. Uh, on all of these companies that we're going to talk about in a little bit. And it, it really has been a disruption from the services perspective because it changes the way that companies are forced to engage with clients <clears throat> and, and maintain those engagements and maintain those relationships. So, um, again, these, a lot of these um, predictions here are echoed in other uh, predictions that TBR has published recently with respect to uh, the full spectrum of IT services and cloud and the rest. So just to give you a sense of where digital fits in, and I, I keep talking about TBR more broadly, um, digital is part of this large, massive amount of research and analysis that we do. Uh, what we're doing right now within the digital space is we're looking at specific vendors. Uh, we're looking at benchmarking their financial performance and their, their performance against their own strategies. And then we're doing client research <clears throat> based on um, both specific requests, uh, you know, sort of ad hoc requests, and then also some, some customer tracking, what, what customers are looking for. Um, that vendor analysis that you see there and the, the vendor disruptor profiles, those are going to roll out about once a month. We've already published uh, two of them on Rocket Fuel and Sapient Nitro, and we'll be rolling out uh, two more this month and a total of 10 uh, in 2015. Um, and that should give you a sense, that one slide should give you a sense of just the breadth of all of TBR's coverage, but then the, um, the specifics around digital. And so with that, now we get to, we've gotten beyond the, the setting the stage part. Now we can dive a lot deeper into, into ad tech and the rest. Seth? So <clears throat> ad tech, <laughs> excuse me. So ad tech, uh, as this illustrates, is, a, is a, essentially a mashup of, <clears throat> excuse me, two totally uh, different practices. So one being advertising, which of course is a component of marketing and technology. So as far as the, uh, the overall ad tech spend, I think it's, or I should say digital ad spend, I think it's important to highlight that. Um, so that being 145 billion, sorry for the, uh, the typo there in 2015. So if you look at ad, uh, the digital ad spend being 150 billion, let's round it up. Um, ad tech is essentially the software that is and, you know, driving, powering, analyzing this spend. And I think a lot of people have a tough time kind of identifying exactly what ad tech is because, you know, you see these numbers floating around out there. But at the end of the day, I think it's really important to understand that top line number of the digital ad spend globally and then realize that ad tech, let's say, five years ago might have captured 10% of spend. It has increased. And, we're, we're estimating it to be roughly 30% in 2015 and a huge component that's, um, you know, driving that growth. So of every digital ad dollar spent moving, say, from 10% up to 30% over the past, say, five years is programmatic. So for those that aren't up to speed on programmatic, that's essentially the, uh, the automation of buying and or selling of digital advertising. And, you know, there, that's a huge business that did not exist five years ago. Um, so to think that that is 
kind of the underlying software that's really helping drive um, performance and analysis and analytics and um, you know a tremendous amount of value with digital ad spend. I think that's kind of the, the key takeaway here. And then you know there's while all of these ad tech vendors that we uh, we cover here today, you know there's certainly technology vendors. Um, many of them operate software as a service, but not all of them are capturing and driving revenue by licensing that software, licensing their technology to the end user. Um, so with that in mind, there's managed services and then there's SaaS-based licensing, um, where clients are essentially taking the technology in-house and running the tools and platforms and everything else um, of the ad tech vendors uh, with their teams. So, uh, you know, that, that makes for an interesting market dynamic. And of course, as far as leaders go, um, Google is, of course, kind of head and shoulders above a lot of other folks right now, um, but they are being challenged by a whole uh, variety of, of pure plays and full stack uh, ad tech vendors who um, definitely pose legitimate um, uh, threats to, to Google's business long term for a, a variety of reasons. So um, just wanted to kind of highlight that as well. And then on the, the digital marketing services side, really what we're looking at here are strategy execution, analytics, um, that includes design. So we didn't want to, when we were figuring out the, uh, the market opportunity, again, it's 150 billion, not million, I uh, apologize for the, uh, the typo there, but um, in kind of uh, figuring out that, that overall opportunity size, um, we didn't want to include a whole lot of just pure play uh, web design shops as far as their revenues. Um, we wanted to go after more of the hybrid guys that, that they might do some, some design work, but they're, they're more technology driven, whether it be, um, you know, platforms they're designing, analytics, uh, that sort of work. So again, combining technology, uh, a lot of software as well. And you think about a, a firm like uh, IBM, a company like IBM, uh, Accenture, they've both made acquisitions in digital marketing services in the last uh, year. Uh, PwC just last spring rolled out a, an entire digital practice um, that's going to be focused on digital marketing with their own creative shop and, and everything to do um, advertising as well. Deloitte has had a huge push in this area. So a lot of what's curious about the, one of, or one of the curious differences between ad tech and, and digital marketing services as we see them is um, for, for us, for TBR, uh, digital marketing services includes a lot of the companies that we've known for a long time. Uh, the ones I just mentioned, Accenture, IBM, Deloitte, PwC, um, and the rest. And then, and then ad tech is much more of a of the the upstarts, the up and coming companies that we haven't looked at as much before. Which, as analysts, is great because <laughs> we're always looking for something new and shiny to go chasing after. So that there's there's the basic difference between the two. Um, and yeah, I'll just. Uh, touch on the, uh, the, the benchmarks that we're working on. Again, we have two sides of the equation. We have the, uh, the peer services, so digital marketing services on the left, and then ad tech or software um, on the right-hand side. And again, we're, uh, we're trying to you know, kind of create um, a benchmark using apples to apples. Uh, it might be a little bit easier in the, uh, the services side of the equation. Um, with the IT, the IT players, management consultants, and the digital natives. Uh, when you get over to the ad tech side of the equation, it gets a little bit uh, more squishy, uh, for lack of a better term. So you have essentially the buy side guys, um, the data management platforms, the ad exchanges, and then what we're calling hybrids, where they uh, essentially service the, the buy and sell side. But um, what we did for the purpose of the benchmark was we took a vendor and basically said, okay, where are they driving the, um, you know, the lion's share of their revenues, and then, you know, we'll, we'll kind of label them based on that. So uh, just to give you a little bit of a, an idea, um, revenue profitability, SaaS versus managed services, um, these are all things that when you're talking about the ad tech sector being kind of new, uh, new to the game and uh, especially not having a whole lot of information from a, uh, a publicly traded company standpoint made it a little bit challenging, but uh, fortunately we were able to have a lot of really good uh, conversations with 
CFOs, CMOs, and other executives at, at some of the private firms as well as the public companies to really understand business models, how they're driving revenues, and um, you know the delivery models as well. And then this is just a, a snapshot, definitely a work in progress, but this gives you an idea as far as the, uh, the ad tech vendors that we're covering, um, going from left to right, the, the revenue delivery. So basically, as I said, you know, most of these vendors here do have a platform, a technology, um, something internally that they're working with that could be termed SaaS, but what we looked at was how are they ultimately driving and delivering the revenues, and was that via uh, a pure license play, or was it a managed services scenario where, you know, maybe the vendor, you know, had their internal team delivering on behalf of the client, just as a um, kind of give you a, an idea of how we measured that. And then agency partner, were reseller versus direct, so basically how how is the vendor going to market, who are they, um, you know, typically selling into, and, uh, and creating some, some metrics surrounding that as well. As we discussed in the beginning here, um, and this, this is definitely, uh, you know, a trend that we're seeing pick up a lot of momentum here, even early on in 2015, is this notion of clients want to ultimately be closer to their data, whereas before, um, you know, a media agency, for example, might run all of the, uh, the digital ad campaigns for a client. Uh, there are, you know, more instances now where the client is either reducing um, their reliance on the media agency, and so when we talk about media agencies, we're talking about uh, Publicis, Omnicom, uh, WPP, IPG, and the like, um, where before a client like Procter & Gamble, for example, would hand over let's say a $50 million ad budget globally to their agency of record. Maybe it's only 25 uh, million this year, or maybe um, they're only letting the agency work on the strategy component, and then P&G in this instance is licensing tools and technologies um, from the ad tech vendors, and then creating up an in-house team of say 10, 20 people, and essentially executing that same program that they used to um, you know, hand off to the agency and the managed services. Format. So the reasons behind that, uh, there's you know plenty of them uh, depending on who you talk to, but uh, we just wanted to kind of highlight a couple of uh, factors driving the uh, the SaaS based um, delivery model versus managed services here. So on the left, you historically had the digital uh, natives and the media agencies in a managed services uh, scenario taking on a lot of projects from the clients, whereas on the right hand side, you still have those same two. Uh, stakeholders, but you have some new players and participants in the game, um, and some of the the business drivers behind going SaaS based, and you know trying to kind of consolidate the number of vendors, and of course that's creating opportunities for integration. Um, whether you're using a couple of best of breed platforms with a legacy uh, back end system or something uh, of the like, that's where you kind of uh, see the IT services guys get involved or they might even be coming in um, through a chief digital officer, CIO, CTO um, office, and then getting engaged in, uh, in digital projects that way. So what's driving, I have to ask, what's driving it towards singular few vendors? Why, why are companies wanting fewer vendors or take P&G, why do they want to knock it down to fewer? Um, great question. So, you know, if you, if you look at some of the, uh, the the numbers thrown out there by different um, analysts and, and even some of the, the brands and agencies have highlighted that uh, the, the deluge of, of vendors out there, if you've seen the Lumascape charts, there are so many hands in the cookie jar now. Um, being able to manage upwards of 15 or 20 vendors just on a sing single campaign execution can be a, a huge time um, you know, resource, and then you talk about the tech tax, so to speak, uh, you know, how many of these vendors kind of overlap um, where, you know, you might not necessarily need 10 vendors in a particular campaign. Maybe you can get the same value using three or four, um, and then you potentially have opportunities instead of using four disparate platforms to, um, you know, have an SI engagement and have a single unified dash. All right. Makes sense. 
just something I hadn't hadn't noticed that on the slide before and it just jumped out at me. All right. Yeah, and then you know, kind of continuing on this this uh, discussion regarding the CMO because uh, you know, depending on what uh, publication you read, the the chief marketing officer may have equal budget or a greater budget than the chief technical officer has um, in 2015. So uh, when you start wielding that kind of, of budget, people take notice. And in the past, you know, basically the uh, the CMO would partner with the media agency or the digital shop, and ad tech would would kind of be engaged through the um, the agency of record. Whereas increasingly, you're seeing the ad tech vendors engage directly with the CMO, as well as IT services, and even the enterprise IT um, software vendors are, are coming direct to the CMO because of the, uh, the marketing automation uh, component coming into the mix. And I should add, you know, from, from an ad tech standpoint, uh, a lot of the vendors are definitely trying to differentiate, uh, whether it be going from a, a single screen or, you know, maybe a multi-channel approach to adding data management as a capability, uh, but increasingly, we're also seeing email and uh, CMS uh, coming into the mix. So I think for 2015, another uh, forecast, if, if you're taking notes, um, we're, we're going to see a lot more ad tech companies bleeding into marketing automation and, you know, potentially vice versa, where somebody like Marketo might have been a, a marketing automation vendor. Um, they've already had alliances with companies uh, like Turn, who is an ad tech pure play uh, so you can definitely anticipate seeing more of that, I think, where uh, ad tech and marketing automation really play well together. It makes sense to kind of marry the two. The CMO-CIO split in terms of budget, I mean, have you seen anything beyond anecdotal about the rise of the CMO's actual budget numbers, or is it more that CMO's budgets are shifting towards spending on technology, whereas it used to be spending on whatever else, the free martini lunches? Great point. Uh, great, great question. I would, I would say definitely as this whole digital transformation that we touched on in the first slide or two is taking place, the CMO, to your point, the, the budget is definitely going towards digital uh, engagements. Um, so it just might be, you know, earmarking instead of a traditional format of media or what have you, it's, it's being digital. And then uh, that's creating this opportunity for the IT services guys, the digital natives, and um, everyone else that uh, has a digital practice overnight. So one of the long-term trends that we've seen uh, in this, in sort of companies broadly, but it, it has a huge impact on IT, has been the change in who becomes a CEO. And so you saw for a while, you know, CFO track was a, a, a smart way to get into the top job. Um, and then, you know, the CIO became, okay, if you were the technology guy, you actually knew what was happening, you could understand and use these new tools and all to make the business run better, then that was, a, well, I, I remember having a, uh, a dinner with one of the companies that list, that's listed in, the, in our benchmark, and on one side was somebody from the marketing um, office, and the other side was, was somebody from the CIO's office, and the question I had for both of them um, that I didn't ask at the same time, so smart enough, was, you know, could somebody from the other side become the, C, could, could somebody from the the technology side become the CMO? Could they understand enough about about marketing and bring that technology background? And of course the answer was, oh no, 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 the marketing CMO has to be a marketing guy. And the answer was the same on the technology side. So I think as this budget grows and that struggle between those two becomes more real, the companies that, and by companies I mean actual, not IT services vendors, not ad tech vendors and digital marketing services vendors, but actual uh, companies doing other business will the ones that are successful are the ones that are going to find a way to to blend those two in the, in a way that they aren't fighting over budget they're actually trying to you know advance the ball. Exactly. At least that's my theory. I'm running with that. So that's my other prediction for 2015. Look look for companies that are able to promote a tech guy into the CMO seat, and then you'll see. All right. And we'd be remiss if we didn't show some of the uh, the act activities whether it's acquisition. Um, or alliances that are going on in the space. So if you look at the left-hand column here of the vendors, uh, those are primarily IT services, uh, software, enterprise guys. Um, there is one marketing automation vendor at the bottom there, Marketo, but you can see a lot of overlap, particularly with a company like Adobe where um, they have alliances with Publicis who uh, made an announcement earlier 
uh, or late last year, I should say, that they were going to standardize on Adobe's uh, data management platform. Um, and at the same time, WePro was going to start utilizing some of the creative suite there. But um, on the flip side, you see SAP and uh, Adobe. So in that instance, SAP is going to be a reseller of Adobe's uh, stack of, of ad tech solutions, which I thought was interesting. Um, and then as far as acquisitions go, uh, Patrick had mentioned Sapient Nitro. That was one of the first what we thought to be an interesting um, independent um, IT services and, and agency vendor that, that was publicly traded. And again, it was, it was one of the few independents left. So the fact that we literally published that and then they were gobbled up, I think we had our, our eyes on an interesting company. So uh, another one that's not on here would be Rocket Fuel. So they acquired a uh, DMP slash DSP X plus one uh, for roughly $240 million. And, you know, there's definitely a lot more action that's going to be happening here in 2015 from, uh, from you know, what we're hearing very early on here. So uh, just wanted to kind of highlight some of the, uh, the interesting acquisitions and some of the alliances that have taken place. And, you know, certainly there's going to be a lot more going on as marketing automation and ad tech uh, start to kind of cross paths as well as, um, you know, enterprise software that, that drives the enterprise. And the PwC Booz and Company uh, acquisitions that, that's noted on here, and their, their new name is Strategy N. Uh, what was curious about that is they, they had just been be, begun building, Booz and Company had, um, a fairly, I don't, know, I don't want to call it substantial because they're still, they were still small, but, but a growing digital practice. And so that acquisition, while I think most of the coverage and the analysis focused on the strategy consulting aspect of it, uh, and the strategy consulting brand that they were buying by buying Booz and Company. Um, the digital component was just as critical for PwC, um, as, as evidenced by them rolling out a, a digital practice. They had they put together a, a few different pieces. I can't for the life of me now think of the other companies they acquired, but it was a few other companies they had acquired that with with uh, Booz and Company it was sort of the the last piece they needed. Um, and then they have an alliance now with Google that um, maybe we can come back to if there's some questions about uh, Google after this. And one last, uh, I guess, interesting acquisition that's noteworthy here, and by far it was not a huge uh, purchase. I estimated it between 50 and $100 million. I think it came in around 70 was Publicis acquiring a company called Run, which for those who aren't familiar with Run was a data uh, buying or sorry, a media buying platform or a DSP, which this was an interesting buy because uh, Publicis has a trading desk which essentially uh, licenses a lot of third-party ad tech and it's an agency trading desk which they don't necessarily own any technology. They might have some interesting little kind of uh, services and other um, add-ons, but for the most part, they're, they're a, uh, a third-party licensing um, body or entity which operated independent and this acquisition is interesting because now instead of licensing a technology, uh, an ad tech firm, Publicis actually owns a media buying entity. So um, that whole notion of, of separating the services from technology and, and being a services driven organization uh, becomes a little bit uh, difficult to kind of discern who does what now, um, and it, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, whether Publicis, from a, uh, a digital media buying standpoint, if they kind of continue the trend towards being a, a vendor versus a pure services organization. And so that, that sort of is the whole summary of what we wanted to cover today. Um, I hope that there was some a lot of value here. Obviously, what we're trying to do is set ourselves up for 2015. We're, we're covering a lot of ground. Um, we're covering a lot of ground that's moving fast. Like Seth mentioned, um, we put out a report on Safety and Nitro. They got acquired, I think, a week later or something. It was kind of crazy. Um, we're, hopefully, we'll be further ahead of the curve than that from now on. Um, our schedule right now, is to publish the advertising technology benchmark uh, by the end of this month and the digital marketing services benchmark at the end of next month. Uh, sometime in the second quarter, we haven't determined exactly when, we're going to release um, both an ad tech and a digital marketing services uh, customer study. That's And just to, to back up, TBR 
uh, has traditionally and, and, and successfully taking, taken a uh, vendor first business lens, business lens approach to our analysis. So we look at all the vendors, we understand what they're doing individually and, and that is what makes up a benchmark, that's what makes up our understanding of the market. Um, in, in recent years, we've started to complement that by doing more customer studies where we're going out and finding out, okay, wh why do you buy, who do you buy from, why do you buy from them, what makes you switch, all the kind of normal questions you would want to know from the customer perspective. When we're able to overlay that on top of what we know about the vendors, we end up with a, a much better picture of what's happening in the market. So in the second quarter of this year, we're going to release um, a customer study for each of those. Uh, in the third quarter, we will put out a, a second edition of each one of the benchmarks. Um, and what we'll do throughout the year um, is publish these vendor profiles. They're probably, what, 15 maybe, 15 slides long. Uh, we cover as much of the vendor as we can, staying within, and Seth mentioned this, mentioned this at the beginning, um, it, it's a lot, of, um, a lot of loose definitions, a lot of terms that are thrown out there, a lot of different descriptions of what people actually do. So our job is really to, to put our taxonomy to it. And so what these vendor profiles do is they, over the course of the year, will give you a look at, according to our taxonomy and according to the way that TBR sees the world and sees the space, what are these different vendors doing? We're not necessarily going to cover vendors that are in the benchmark, we may be covering vendors who are smaller but growing faster and are more interesting uh, or doing something that's, that's different or completely outside of the space but we believe they're getting in. So we're, we've got a lot of flexibility in terms of which uh, vendors we're going to cover. It'll be a total of 20 reports over the course of the year. Um, and then I don't know, I'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip back to the, uh, the prediction slide and if there are any questions out there, we'll go ahead and, and take them at this time. Sure. Um, this is Allison. So uh, thanks, guys, for the presentation. One of the things Patrick did not mention, uh, and it would be remiss if we didn't, a lot of people on the phone today are representing companies that are covered in the benchmark. So if you're not already talking to Seth uh, and would like to brief him, please feel free to reach out to either Seth or myself to arrange those conversations. We do actually want to hear from these companies as well uh, what they're doing, what they're seeing in the market, uh, and if they have questions about the competitors, that's what we're here for. Um, so I do encourage you to, Patrick eventually will go back uh, to all the social media stuff to reach out to any one of us on the call uh, as well as follow us on the social media. Um, so we had a couple questions around uh, um, acquisitions, guys. The first question was, which ad tech firm is the next candidate for IPO or acquisition? Hey, Allison, this is Seth, of course. Um, great question. So, I, wow, there, there are a handful of the, uh, the demand side platforms or DSPs that have said they are on the cusp of, of filing for an S1. Um, so I think it's a matter of timing. Uh, difficult to say who, but I would say probably some of the ones that are carrying a, a larger, um, you know, top line revenue, so turn, media mass, um, data zoo the trade desk these are these are all uh, you know DSPs that are that are pretty pretty substantial as far as their revenues and headcount and geo footprint um, so that's that's just off the cuff here all right uh, next question we have which private DMS firm uh, which private DMS firms are acquisition targets um, only because I, I had my ear to the track to a certain extent with sapient Nitro um, you know, I think a company like Merkel is interesting because I do think they, they are essentially taking on the, the DNA that some of the larger holding companies are trying to through their trading desks. So, for example, um, you know, Vibiki, which is Publicis Trading Desk, uh, kind of licensing different platforms and, and so forth, that, that's one of, you know, hundreds of agencies or maybe 150 that they own. Whereas Merkel is a uh, independent, privately held, um, you know, it's, it's a pure play, and they are they are really a kind of a technology-driven agency. So um, I think they've they've got a pretty good grasp on all the nuances of the technology and the way the market's moving, uh, and I, I think they're well positioned, um, you know, as far as you know, just trends in the industry. Uh, we have one more question in case if anyone out there has another question you'd like to pose, please send it through the Q&A or chat function now. Uh, last question right now is, there are so many ad tech firms, how do clients firms, or how do clients DMS firms stay up to speed on who does what? 
Uh, that's the million dollar question. So, of course, you could subscribe to, uh, to TBR's <laughs> collateral. Um, I, I would say, you know, some of the, the industry publications that I follow, uh, Media Post, Ad Exchanger, uh, the, those tend to be pretty good. Of course, you know, you follow your, your specific hashtags on Twitter. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a fast-moving, dynamic space, which is why I love it. But, um, yeah, those are just a couple ideas. Patrick, I'll let you. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that question plays perfectly into one of the themes um, that we looked at for IT services more broadly, and, and that is the rise, the expected spike in consulting revenue or consulting demand, which will turn into revenues um, in 2015 going into 2016. What we're seeing now across a lot of – but what we're hearing from vendors and what we're hearing from IT services customers across really the entire spectrum is this confusion and uncertainty over emerging technologies, whether it's digital or business intelligence or big data analytics, uh, social, mobile, the whole mess, and cloud, and, and throw that in there as well. And the, the sense that we're at the tipping point where adoption and sort of assimilation of these technologies into um, into the business fully to drive the, the kind of outcomes they're looking for is either you have to do it now or, or you're going to get left behind. I, I was on a webinar last week and I quoted uh, Ricky Bobby, you're either first or last, which which is ridiculous. You're of course not first or last. There's lots of, there's lots of companies that have done well being fast followers, but I think the fear right now is that a fast follower will, will fall too far behind. And so, we're expecting that consulting is going to make a huge um, spike in, in 2015, and I think it, within the digital space, uh, the companies that are probably best uh, suited right now to take advantage of that are the ones that have that true end-to-end -end capability. I mean, you look at a, um, an Accenture uh, or even IBM that have a legacy of providing both technology uh, solutions and, and business solutions and consulting advice um, and, and have built up over the last year and a half, two years, three years maybe, uh, a substantial digital practice to include not just making acquisitions but actually hiring folks with that creative background uh, and marrying them with the technologists and uh, putting them all together in bed with the strategy consultants I think is going to be where we're going to see a lot of growth, at least in the, in the next couple of years. It will taper off, I mean, once companies are, um, are, are better at uh, actually leveraging and harnessing these technologies, then the, the role for consulting diminishes, although it, it always just changes over time. Consulting never goes away. Um, but I think that's I think I think I look at this space and I think about Accenture and IBM, um, even PwC doing doing really well uh, in the near term and and going into 2016. Uh, looks like we don't have any other questions in queue right now, so I'm gonna um, give people another minute or so in case they have any last minute questions for them through now. And with that, I'm gonna start to wrap up the presentation. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today on the first of what we hope will be many presentations in our uh, ad tech. Uh, digital media services program. So I look forward to working with you more as we go forward. And I want to thank the analysts for their time today. Uh, Patrick, if you could put that slide back to the social media link so everybody can see those, uh, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Uh, too far, too far. Come back. <laughs> so as I was mentioning, I encourage everyone here to follow Patrick, Seth, as well as TBR on the Twitter handles listed here, as well as join our conversations on Slide, Test Share, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Uh, as well, there's also some um, free research that Seth has done. I think there was a paper you wrote on two mogul Seth uh, and maybe some other pieces that are accessible. You can download them from our website and read what Seth is saying about the market. So I do encourage you to join um, that conversation there. On your way out of the webinar, there's a short three survey question. How good were the presenters? How valuable was the content of the information? And open-ended feedback. So if there are things that you want to see more of, want to see less of, any feedback you guys can provide us, uh, we do use that to change our presentations quarter to quarter because we do realize that you're very busy professionals and want to make sure that you have the information you need to do your job well. Um, so if there's things that you want to see, we'd like to hear about that so we can tailor these presentations to meet your needs. Uh, with that, I'm going to close in the webinar. I want to thank again everyone for your time today, and we look forward to speaking with you in the near future. So have a great Tuesday afternoon, everyone.